Electrical Diagnosis Tools The key to making diagnosis simple is using the right tools the right way. We're going to describe a few diagnosis tools that are easy to use, tell you how to use each, and show examples of their use in diagnosis. The tools we'll cover are the jumper wire, the 12-volt test light, the DC voltmeter, the 120-volt test light, the AC voltmeter, hertz or cycle meter, and the self-powered test lights. Also, the ohm meter, the amprobe or wraparound ammeter, the conventional ammeter, and the capacitor tester. Every motorhome electrical man should have access to all these tools to simplify his job. They're all easy to use, as we'll see. Before getting into the tool usage, though, let's briefly review what an electric circuit is and why they sometimes require diagnosis. An electrical circuit, you'll recall, is simply a round-trip path for electricity to flow from a power source to a load and back to the source. In this 12-volt reading lamp circuit, the power source is the battery or power converter. By load, we mean the component that changes electrical power into light, sound, heat, or motion. Examples are lamps, electric motors, solenoids, heaters, buzzers, and so on. Now, for a circuit to work properly, there are three basic requirements. First, there must be power in the hot side of the circuit, that is, power from the source up to the load. If the hot circuit is open or grounded out, the load won't do its job. Second, the load itself must be okay, not shorted or burned out, or overloaded mechanically in the case of a motor or solenoid. Third, there must be a continuous return path from the load to the source. On 12-volt systems, this is the ground circuit. On 120-volt systems, the white common wire completes the return path. When a circuit fails to operate properly, one of these three conditions isn't being met. We use the testing tools to find out which it is and to pinpoint the trouble. Let's start with the simplest tool, the jumper wire. We use jumper wires in three ways. One, for bypassing a part of the circuit that seems to be open, two, to apply power directly to the load for a quick test of load operation, and three, to ground a circuit if the ground is suspected of being open. Most jumper wires you buy come with alligator clips on the ends, but it's also good to have jumpers with assorted ends, such as probe tips, sockets, plugs, and so forth, to match the wiring terminals where you'll be working. Usually, you can make up what you need from scrap wiring harnesses. A couple of important points. First, be sure the jumper wire is as heavy as or heavier than the wire in the circuit. And second, make your wires long so they'll reach between points some distance apart. Now for some examples of using the jumper. Suppose you're troubleshooting a furnace that won't fire and you suspect the thermostat is faulty. All you need do is remove the thermostat cover and connect a jumper across the two terminals of the wires that go to the furnace. If the furnace fires with the wires jumped, then you know the thermostat or its wiring is faulty. Another example. The water pump doesn't operate, and you want to find out if the pump motor is okay. Disconnect the hot lead to the pump, which is the blue lead with the inline fuse. Then, run a jumper wire directly from the battery or the main power terminal on the fuse block to the pump motor terminal. If the pump starts up, the motor is good and the trouble is somewhere else in the circuit. Suppose the pump doesn't start. You can use another jumper to check the ground. Remove the black wire and clip the second jumper to its terminal. Touch the other end of the jumper to ground. Now, if the pump starts up, you have only to repair the ground. If it doesn't run with power applied directly and with a motor grounded, then the motor or pump is at fault. Incidentally, always refer to the wiring diagram to determine which wire is the hot lead and which is ground. As this section of the diagram shows, we could check the furnace ground by connecting a grounded jumper wire to the black wire terminal. 
Normally, in the 12-volt system, the ground wire is black. Next, let's talk about the 12-volt test light, which we use to determine if a test point is hot. In other words, if voltage is available at a given point. The test light works very simply. You ground the lead wire and touch the probe tip to the terminal or test point. If the light comes on, the circuit is hot at that point. The light will glow brightly if full voltage is available, or dimmer if the voltage is reduced by some resistance between the test point and the source. This test light has a sharp pointed probe, so you can insert it into wiring connectors, or even pierce a wire's insulation to check if the wire is hot. Keep the tip sharpened to avoid making large holes in insulation, and if the wire is exposed after testing, tape over the hole in the insulation to avoid a short. Now for an example of using it. Let's suppose we have a string of lights that don't work, and referring to the schematic, we find they're all on fuse number five. At the fuse panel, with the test light lead grounded, we can test for voltage to the fuse and from the fuse. If we have voltage to the fuse and none away from it, we probably just need a new fuse. However, if there is power away from the fuse, the circuit is open somewhere between the fuse and lamps, and that's where it can be very handy to have a probe tip. We trace the feed wire from the fuse, and wherever we can get at the wire conveniently, push the probe through the insulation. Where the light glows at one point and doesn't glow at another, the circuit is open between the two points. Splices are a good place to test in such a situation. Check for voltage into the splice and away from it to see if the splice is open. In case of a complete failure of the 12-volt system, you can test for voltage in at the main fuse block terminal and out of the power converter with the 12-volt test lamp and use it to isolate where the power supply is open. Sometimes in diagnosis, it is necessary to measure the amount of voltage available rather than just know it's there. In that case, we use a voltmeter. For the 12-volt system, a DC voltmeter is required. Typically, the DC voltmeter will have two or more scales. The selector knob should be set to a scale with a range higher than the anticipated voltage. And be sure the meter is set to the correct polarity. The meter has two leads, a negative black lead and a positive red lead. To measure available voltage, you ground the negative black lead and touch the red or positive lead to the hot test point. The meter should read about 13 volts available at the battery. The DC voltmeter is used in testing the vehicle's Delcatron generator by measuring the increase in voltage at the battery when the engine is driving the generator. It can also be used to measure the regulated output voltage of the power converter. This is done most conveniently at the wire terminal that connects to the fuse block. Also, in diagnosing the Onan motor generator for a no-start problem, one test is to measure the voltage across the K1 start solenoid while cranking the engine. If the meter reads less than 12 volts, the solenoid must be replaced. In problems where a DC motor runs slowly or a light burns dimly, the voltmeter can be used to locate a high resistance condition by measuring voltage drop. For that, you use a lower volt scale. Connect the positive lead to the battery side of the motor and the negative lead toward ground. Be sure both connections are on the same circuit. With the switch on so that the load is drawing electric current, read the scale. Anything over about half a volt drop with the load operating indicates that there's a high resistance condition between the meter leads, which usually means a poor connection. You can isolate it by moving the leads closer together until the high voltage drop goes away. Next, let's look at the 120 volt test light. It is used to test for available voltage in the motorhome's AC system. If a 12 volt test light were used there, the high voltage would burn out the bulb. To use this test light,
clip or touch one lead to the common or white wire terminal, the other to the hot black wire terminal. If the light glows, the test point is hot. The 120 volt test light can be used to test if a wall receptacle, for instance, is hot. It should glow brightly. If it glows dimly, there's a poor connection somewhere or low voltage. It is frequently used to test for voltage at individual circuit breakers in the 120 volt box. If a breaker is open, the light will not glow with its lead at the power out terminal. Also, if the light isn't bright at the breaker box, there's something wrong with the voltage supply, motor generator trouble, low campsite voltage, or a high resistance condition in the shoreline power cord. Now, if it's necessary to measure the voltage in the 120 volt system, we use an AC voltmeter with a scale selected to cover the voltage range we're concerned with. Also, be sure the controls are set for AC voltage. The AC voltmeter's negative lead goes to the white common wire terminal and the red lead to the test point. Here, the meter is shown reading about 120 volts at the service box, indicating a good power supply. In diagnosing problems with roof air conditioning, we frequently use the AC voltmeter to measure the voltage available to the compressor motor input terminal, and also at the overload breaker switch terminal. This is because the compressor motor won't start and stay running unless the voltage is up to specifications. On the electric refrigerator, during AC operation, there must be 22 to 24 volts AC to the compressor assembly for the 7.5 cubic foot model. For the 6 cubic foot model, there must be 19 to 21 volts AC. If the voltage is lower, a refrigerator problem could be caused by something wrong with the power supply. Incidentally, you use the AC meter to check the voltage to this compressor in DC operation also because the inverter is changing the DC to AC to operate the refrigerator. However, the reading will be higher because of the voltage output characteristics of the inverter. It should check between 31.5 and 33.5 volts when operating from the inverter. A special application of the AC voltmeter is in combination with a Hertz or cycle meter. With the two together, you can read both the frequency and voltage of the motor generator at the same time. For testing or adjusting the motor generator, you plug the combination meter into the shoreline receptacle from the generator. When the generator is working properly and running at specified RPM, the frequency meter will read 59 to 63 hertz cycles per second and the voltmeter between 110 and 126 volts depending on the electrical load. So far, we have looked at two test lights that use circuit power to check for the presence of voltage. Now let's look at the corresponding self-powered test lights. A 12-volt self-powered test light and a 120-volt self-powered test light. They are used to check for continuity. Continuity simply means that the circuit or component is closed or continuous between two test points. The pocket-sized 12-volt self-powered test light operates from a self-contained 1.5-volt battery. To check out the tester, touch the lead end to the tip. If the light comes on, the battery and bulb are okay. Earlier, we diagnosed an open thermostat by bypassing its leads with a jumper. Before replacing the thermostat, the open condition should be verified with a continuity test. To test for continuity, Connect the 1.5 volt self-powered test lamp across the leads to the thermostat and set it to close the switch. If the test light comes on, the thermostat is good. You can use this tester to check continuity of any switch before installing a new one, since the problem may be a bad connection rather than a bad switch. It also can be used to test diodes. For example, this inline diode in the electro-level compressor control circuit. Remember that a diode is a one-way electrical valve, so to speak. So you should have continuity or low resistance with the leads across the diode one way, 
but no continuity or high resistance when you reverse the leads. The self-powered test light also is used frequently to test a ground circuit. With the switch off, connect the test light between the load ground terminal and a known good ground. If the light comes on, the ground circuit is good. One example is to test a starter armature for grounded windings. Touch one probe tip to the shaft and the other to each commutator segment. If the light glows, the winding is grounded. However, in any continuity test, if the test light glows dimmer than normal, it indicates a high resistance condition. If that can't be corrected by fixing a bad connection, the component may have to be repaired. When using self-powered test lights, remember that only the 12-volt test light should be used to continuity test 12-volt equipment. The high voltage of the 120-volt test light could damage 12-volt DC equipment. Let's look at the ohmmeter now. It is used to measure electrical resistance in ohms. It also can be used to check for continuity. A high reading or infinite resistance indicates an open circuit. The symbol for infinite resistance resembles the figure 8 laying on its side. To use the ohmmeter, you first select a scale multiplier to get the proper resistance range for your test. For instance, to check a motor generator coil primary winding, we'll be looking for 4.3 ohms, so we'd set the selector for times 1. Then, touch the two leads together and turn the set, or zero, knob until the meter reads zero. Now you're ready to measure resistance. Connect the leads across the device being tested. In this example, the terminals of the primary winding in the coil. The meter is reading just over four ohms, which indicates that this winding has the correct resistance. Now the secondary resistance spec is 14,000 ohms. So we'd set the selector for times 100 and again zero the meter before taking the measurement. Another example for using an ohmmeter is testing the refrigerator inverter primary winding which should have a resistance of about 12 ohms and must not be grounded. With the connector separated touch the meter leads to the white wire terminals and read the resistance. If it's too high or too low the transformer must be replaced. At the same time, check the winding for grounding by leaving one test lead at the connector and touching the other to the mounting plate. The meter should read an open circuit. The ohmmeter also is a good tool for checking diodes. Here we have the meter connected across a battery isolator diode and are reading a very slight resistance. With the leads reversed, the resistance is very high almost infinite. The diode would be okay with a 10 to 1 ratio between the two readings, but most often they'll read almost zero and almost infinity in opposite directions. Next, let's look at the amprobe or snap-on ammeter, which may also have an ohmmeter and voltmeter combined with it. An ammeter measures how much current the circuit is drawing or the amount of current flow in an AC circuit. The unit of measure of current draw or flow is the ampere, abbreviated amps. This measurement, when compared to specifications, tells you if the circuit is overloaded, shorted, or in some cases, underloaded. To use the amp probe to measure current draw, snap the meter probe around the power wire and be sure it's around one wire only. If you get it around both the black and white wire in a circuit, the reading will be incorrect. With the circuit in operation, read its draw in amps on the scale. It's shown here on an individual circuit in the breaker box checking for current draw. If it's too high, the circuit probably has too many appliances plugged into it. The AM probe is frequently used to measure current draw by the compressor motor in roof air conditioning or the refrigerator. Here it is snapped on the power line to the air conditioning compressor. If the current draw is low, it can indicate a loss of refrigerant. The compressor motor is underloaded. It's loafing. 
High current draw means an overload, too much refrigerant, some type of problem with the motor, or a low voltage supply to the motor causing it to strain itself to run. DC current draw can be measured with a conventional ammeter. It's just a little less convenient. First, you have to shut off the circuit to hook up the meter. Then, separate a wire or connector at some convenient point and hook the meter in series with the circuit. Be sure the positive lead is toward the power source and the negative lead toward ground. Also, if you have to open a multiple connector, use a jumper wire as necessary to complete the circuit. Use a meter with the right range for the job. Make sure the selector is set properly, and if the meter has more than one scale, select the scale that will most accurately measure the specified draw. The final instrument we want to look at is the capacitor tester, used to check start and run capacitors used with some 120 volt AC motors. It's very simple to use following the instructions that come with it. Connect the black lead tip to the identified or marked terminal on the capacitor and the red lead to the other. If there is no identified terminal, connect the leads either way. Plug the tester into a 120 volt source and select the proper position for start or run capacitors. Press the button and if the capacitor is good, the light will flash on and go off. If it's bad, the light will either flicker or stay on continually. So those are the basic tools of electrical diagnosis. Learn how to use them, keep them in good repair, and follow the approved diagnosis procedures in the maintenance manual to make electrical diagnosis simple and fast.